through 10 after, but the official class stuff. All right. So um, this I thought is pretty interesting. This is Sophia the robot. That unfortunately I've got an advertisement. See there, there's Sophia the robot. And Sophia the robot walks around and talks to people and offers to help people who are um, alone, like caring for elderly people and stuff. Looks quite human. And they've now made um, a few dozen of them. They're manufacturing. Now they're planning to sell thousands of robots this year. So uh, these things may become common. <clears throat> and supposedly they have AI. So we will see what comes of that. And it's coming from Hong Kong. I know in Japan, they've got a lot of robots too, uh, but I haven't seen anything so good for sale yet. Uh, Regeneron is the antibody cocktail that Donald Trump got when he got sick. And the treatment I've heard of it is after you get exposed to uh, after, um, COVID, it makes you resist it more quickly, but apparently it's useful to prevent infection. If you go to a high risk place like a nursing home and you give people the Regeneron, then even when they're exposed, they won't catch it because the antibodies are already in their blood. So that is an interesting idea. It is not a vaccine which stimulates your body to make the antibodies. It's just sticking the antibodies directly in you. So uh, that is another way to do it. Let me adjust this on the participants list. All right. There. Anyway. I'm going. All right. And uh, this guy wants to be the governor of California. Um, a lot of people are very angry at the governor of California right now. They feel, uh, I think, mostly about the COVID response. But a bunch of people are talking about having a recall of the governor and uh, having various people run for him. So this guy, uh, whose name looks like a little hard to pronounce, Paula Pitaya. Anyway, he's, um, various people are talking about running to try to replace our current governor. So we'll see what comes of that. It has happened before. This one sort of surprised me. We have a moral imperative to make AI weapons like the Terminator the argument being that they will be less likely to make mistakes than humans, which is an interesting attitude to take. And I wonder if they can actually prove any of that. That seems like a pretty, uh, I remember I used to say I loved self-driving cars for the same argument. And that might be true, but uh, anyway, uh, other people have strongly felt like we should not have robots shooting weapons. That should be something that always requires human judgment anyway. Um, we will see where it goes. <laughs> uh, and so GameStop is a face-to-face -face seller of video games, which is a kind of dying industry, like a face-to-face -face seller of video cartridges. So one of the um, investment recommendation spots said, this stock is going to fall short it. So the loyal customers of this and a bunch of other people that just like making trouble formed a sort of flash mob and they've been buying this stock like crazy. So it's gone up by like a factor of four or five just to completely hose all those people who tried to short it. And, sh and uh, so that's the game. It's up 275%. And a bunch the people who shorted it are going to lose a pile of money. And the, uh, the people buying it are seeing this as like a great sort of prank to keep buying it and keep pushing the price higher. Um, it's interesting to me because it demonstrates what's wrong with Bitcoin. Um, a lot of people buy Bitcoin because it's going up, but it's the same. It's going up because people are buying it, not because there's any actual value. And this is uh, what's called a bubble. Uh, it's closely related to pyramid scheme. These are, these are products that sell for a price that does not reflect a real value. And the problem is you aren't really making money. You just think you're making money because your number is big on a chart. But when you try to sell it, the first few people that sell can sell and get their money. And then the price collapses and all the rest of them don't get their money. So you, you feel rich, but when you actually try to get the money, you probably won't be able to get it. That's the problem with bubbles. Anyway, um, so pseudo has a heap-based buffer overflow. And sudo is the command to elevate yourself to root on a Linux-based system. And apparently this is true of many versions of Linux and it's been this way for a long time. And there's a proof of concept little video where you just run something, you become root. So uh, that's pretty interesting. 
and I guess I guess it'll be patched pretty soon. And uh, I didn't see enough information anywhere to like reproduce the exploit, but there's quite a bit of details available here and on the uh, linked page. Um, there are a ton of these local privilege escalations. If you do the um, hacking uh, training products like uh, Hack the Box, they just expect you once you get in a box to escalate the privileges. Uh, in my experience, if you let any box get more than about three months out of date, there's a known privilege escalation vulnerability on it. And on Windows, there are always privilege escalation vulnerabilities that are ridiculous. They don't even seem interested in patching them. You can just use Metasploit and use Get System, and it will work on almost every Windows system. <coughs> so Biden has said he is going to use the um, Defense Production Act or something, something left over from, I think, World War II, where they can force industries to produce things for the national good to make more vaccine. But of course, on the yeah, Defense Production Act, if you look at it, that doesn't really make any sense because you can't just order somebody like Pfizer to make more vaccine. The fact is it takes about a year to set up the factory and all the equipment and the reagents and stuff. And you know, they are making it as fast as they can. They're aware of the fact that everybody wants it now. You can yell at them all you want, but it takes time to ramp up these factories. So it is not clear. Uh, you might be able to get somebody to make more face masks or something. I mean, you might get some gut out of these Defense Production Act, but just generating more of the vaccine we want right away is not going to happen. Unfortunately, I'd like it too. Anyway, so here we are. This is CNET 126, the Tuesday class. Uh, we would have started last week, but there was a guest speaker, so I delayed the start of the normal class lectures to this week. And so um, we are going to, in this uh, so here's the schedule. You'll see that we have some more guest speakers coming and the schedule works around them. The guest speakers I think are very popular and very valuable. They give you a good look at what you might want to do as um, in the world of security, what kind of jobs you might want to get. And I'm just adjusting my screen. There we go. So anyway, I'm just going to talk about the first couple chapters today. Uh, one thing to be aware of is the Kindle book has the chapters mislabeled compared to the paper book. So anyway, um, that's why I give the full title. The first two chapters here are what I'm proposing to start talking about. Anyway, what we're going to do here is learn how to analyze malware. And um, a lot of people complaining that CNET 126 is not showing in their canvas. Really? Oh, well, that's weird. Um, well, uh, maybe there's something wrong with the City College Canvas. Is anybody a City College student that does see it in their Canvas? I don't see it either. Oh, well, that's a problem. Okay, uh, thanks for telling me. I don't have an awful lot of control. I do not see. It says it was published. Mm. <clears throat> okay, well, um, if you want to start taking quizzes and stuff, you can use the public Canvas server which, ah, all right. Let me get the public Canvas server available then, because that is the one I can control. Um, I'll just do it right now. It's um, here. All right, take me a second. I made a public Canvas server for people who are not City College students, and the City College students can use it too in a pinch. Um, although, then you'd end up with your scores kind of spread off across a couple of servers. Canvas may not roll it out until then. They saw somebody scheduled to start on February 1. Wow. Uh, well, now let me research this, what you're saying. Let me try the City College. If they've set it to start February 1, that would totally explain it. And um, let me, and I probably can't change it. That's why I really don't like using City College's official stuff, but I've been doing it during the pandemic to try to fit with what people expect. Okay, here's my published courses. Here's 126. And if I go to the settings, um, starts January 19, which is last week, ends May 27. No, that's, that's totally, it should be started. There shouldn't be anything about February 1 on there. Um, hmm. Well, this is pretty serious. Um, well, Canvas shows for me, enrolled as students published, but it's not accessible. 
Well, that's not good. Um, anyway, I think I don't think I want to send you all to the public server just yet because uh, that'll make a mess when we try to get it organized later. Um, let me contact somebody at City College and see if I can get somebody to fix this. Um, I and by next week, you don't really need the canvas. Um, you just won't be able to take the quizzes until the canvas comes up and uh, they're not due. You, you, um, it's okay if you don't get them done by next week. Um, hmm. Well, thanks for telling me. I will contact uh, someone at City College and see if I can figure it out. If not, we can all use my public server. That would be another option. But um, I should get, I can attempt to use the City College server first because otherwise it's really going to make a mess. Anyway, that's good to know. Uh, there's always something. Anyway, so we're going to cover um, analyzing malware, figure out how it works. Uh, you will see that there's quite a bit of material in this course, and it's a little unorganized because I had to update everything. The textbook here was written back in the days of Windows XP, and it's quite useful and quite valuable, but it's considerably out of date. So I've added, I've updated the projects and replaced them all with new versions. So um, you'll see when you get down to the hands-on projects down here, there are two major categories. The first one uses Windows 2016. And in my previous semesters, I used Google Cloud machines for everything. But Google Cloud started charging students for them after the trial ran out without warning them. So they complained. And I said, well, I'm not going to use it anymore um, because some students might end up having to pay them some money. So I switched back to using local virtual machines in VMware or VirtualBox, which is free. The problem is some students have very weak or very old machines or, or no room on the hard drive or something, so they can't run those local machines. So if that happens, you might have to use Azure. Azure has a free trial that's more limited, but that's one option. Anyway, this is the, these are the main projects. And you'll see some have points, and some of them have points and extra points. So that means 20 points is the part of this project that's required. The rest is extra credit, and there is a lot of extra credit. So you can make up for missing quizzes and everything else by doing extra credit projects because most people care about the hands-on more than anything else. And these are the basic techniques we're going to study how to analyze how malware runs in machines and how Windows runs underneath it. But last semester, I got into using a, another, another FireEye product called the Flare VM. And the Flare VM is wonderful. This is a special malware analysis virtual machine that runs on Windows 10. And I put it on Azure, but you can also run Windows 10 locally. And once you have the Flare VM, you get a whole bunch of more modern tools. And I went and, uh, and used this Windows internals book as a supplemental book and got a lot more things working. All these are extra credit. So you can do just this stuff and that's enough, but you may want to move more deeply into Windows. And all this is understanding much more how Windows works, how libraries work, how the API calls work. Um, and we get to DIL proxying, which is wonderful. And uh, I had a Microsoft engineer in the class last semester, and he told me about the new version of WinDebug, which is very nice, only available on Windows 10. And it makes it a lot easier to debug the kernel and to debug software with source level debugging and such. So I have quite a few um, kernel debugging projects here to the debugger driver. So, well, these are all extra credit, but they're really quite valuable. And there's a few down here in Ghidra. Ghidra is an NSA tool to analyze software used to reverse engineer and design attacks from the NSA. And for some reason, they released a version of it into the public domain about a year ago. And there's a whole book in Ghidra, which I put up here as an extra uh, supplemental book. And I covered a bit of it here. So learning how to use Ghidra is a useful tool. But anyway, um, so let me just go to the first chapter, which gives you uh, an overview of, of what we're going to do here. Let me change my share to my keynote. Ah, there we are. Good. All right. So this will be the first two chapters in the book that we covered tonight. All right. So malware analysis. Um, how in-depth are we going to go with Ghidra? Not very in-depth at all. That book goes quite in-depth, but I've only covered a little bit of it so far. I might add some more extra credit projects, but uh, we're not going to go very far into Ghidra. There are whole courses in Ghidra at Black Hat and stuff, and it's really quite worth it. But this is only going to be like one lesson or half of a lesson, that sort of thing. <coughs> anyway, malware analysis. 
Now, the point of malware analysis is to understand what has happened to your machine when you get infected. And so here's something that happened to me. One of my students went off and started a consulting company and started doing tech support for people. And then he called me and he said, hey, this doctor's office just called me and they found malware. So I just re-imaged that machine and they said, okay, leave, you're done. And I said, I don't feel like I'm done. Do you feel like I should quit here? And uh, I said, no because you don't know what happened. You don't know if other machines were infected. You don't know if data was stolen. You know, that is not what you do. This is what a lot of people really do, but this is not a sufficient incident response for a modern company. You should know how, if that malware could still be there, uh, the person who came in with the malware might've placed other backdoors and stuff on the system. Um, so that's after malware is found, you need to know, did an attacker implant other kinds of malicious software on your machine, are they gone? Are they still on your network wandering around stealing things? And then how did they get in? How do I improve security so somebody else doesn't come in the same way? That's a lot of work, but that's what you have to do these days in instant response. LinkedIn got hacked several years ago. People, uh, the attacker stole the password hashes, cracked a bunch of them, and then took 30,000 password hashes that were harder to crack and posted them on a Russian crime forum. So the malware analysis community, which by the way, is on Twitter, you should all be on Twitter. Twitter is the way security professionals and often criminals communicate with each other about security issues. And so I saw on Twitter, LinkedIn got hacked. Here's the forum with the hashes. So I went to the hashes and I found my LinkedIn password. And then several other people did the same thing. And LinkedIn issued an official statement saying, oh, it's all fake. Nobody hacked us. And we said, no, it's real. They really got my password. You're lying. LinkedIn tried to continue lying for a couple of weeks. Then they said, we asked our lawyer and our lawyer said, we don't have to do anything. So we're just not going to do anything about it. And I said, I don't think that's going to fly either. And a couple of months later, they really had to go through breach cleanup, pay fines, pay for upgrades. You know, you uh, this is the normal thing that happens in the world of security. When people have a security problem, when you first tell them, they just say, oh, shut up and go away, you're lying. Then they say, well, it doesn't matter. And then very reluctantly, they admit, you know, it's actually a problem. We actually have to spend a lot of money and time fixing it. You know, it's a painful awakening to discover that you really have to, uh, have to pay, invest in security. Because people typically design their business and they don't consider that. Like, we'll sell you software in a cardboard box on a floppy in the old days. And these days you'll download it. And then the, you give you money and the transaction is done. And then when you come back six months later and say there's a security problem, I don't care. That's not my problem, right? I already got your money. But it's so selling somebody software is more like adopting a child than it is like selling them a candy bar where the transaction is over, you have the money, and then it's done. So, you know, it, they, it, they don't enjoy discovering that they have to put a lot more work into supporting and maintaining their product. Yeah, well, the reputation damage, I see people in the comments, is very interesting. Reputation damage is really hard to assess. Like um, TJ Maxx got hacked, they just went right on. Uh, stock prices fall, but they usually come back a day or two later. It's not that clear how much reputation damage matters. And when they interview average consumers, they don't understand what security means. They don't understand what a hack means. I mean, if a company gets hacked, they announce they got breached. Should you quit shopping there? Actually, I'm more inclined to shop there because that means they actually went through a security upgrade. <laughs> the ones that have not announced a breach probably got hacked too and just don't know it. Anyway, it's a, it's a tough business. Anyway, so if you are one of the more enlightened modern companies, then you admit that you have to understand what malware is doing. And so this is where you dissect malware to figure out what you need to know about it, which is what harm does it do, how to detect it, how to clean it off. Now, you could spend months analyzing a piece of malware to learn everything about it, and that's not what anybody wants. What you want is to learn just the important facts. So you want to know um, what happened, how to locate the infected machines, how to contain the damage. And um, so you might want signatures to detect it. Now, you can have host-based signatures, which are things like files or registry keys or running processes or network connections you detect on one machine. If you can detect network traffic that the, that the infected machines put out, like bots, remote control bots that make your machines part of a botnet, phone home with a probe every minute or 30 seconds or something. And when you can detect that, that's really nice because then you can just scan the network traffic for your whole company and find all the infected machines that are beaconing home. 
So that's nice when, when you get that chance. Um, it can be abused. City College had a incident where they hired a crooked chief technology officer and he hired a crooked network consultant who falsely claimed that all our machines were infected. And he claimed he was using a secret proprietary network forensic tool. And he claimed that he found 200 Windows viruses on our Linux DNS servers because he was looking at network traffic and he wouldn't tell us exactly how he did this, but my impression is he got a list of malicious IP addresses. There's a bunch of those out there, IP addresses and domains that are known to have been used for criminal purposes. And he saw some traffic going to those addresses. Now, if you receive spam from some malware server, your email server will send a probe back to it to make a DNS request to look for things like an SPF record and other records that your email server uses to decide whether to um, accept that email. So if I send email from a malicious server, there will be some traffic sent back to the server, even in a network that is secure, that never delivers the email, that never opens the attachment and gets infected. So I think that's what's going on here. He was finding network traces, which he misunderstood as evidence of an infection, when in fact there wasn't an infection, because of course we didn't have any Windows viruses on our Linux servers. And almost all the viruses he claimed to find were not really there. So this is a problem with all these tools. If you are not careful, you can have false positives where you think you have found an infection, but there is no infection. So here's the basic techniques. There's two basic techniques you use to, to analyze malware, and they come in uh, basic and advanced forms. Static analysis examines the malware without running it. So you can use virus total or an antivirus product where you just scan it and it just tells you if it recognizes it from a library of known malware. That would be nice. Of course, then you don't really have to analyze it. You just have to connect to somebody else's previous analysis. Strings or bin text look for readable strings in the file and you can read those and get a pretty good idea what it does. Or you can use a disassembler like Ida Pro or Ghidra uh, to take apart the uh, executable code and turn it into a somewhat more readable form. Then there's dynamic analysis, where you run the malware in a virtual machine, deliberately infect it, and then you run some tools to monitor what happens to the operating system. You look for registry changes, processes that are launched, uh, network traffic, and other things on that machine. When I first heard about this, I was shocked because of course, you're running tools on an infected machine. And of course, the infection will alter that machine, so you can't trust them. And I expected more perfection, but here's the fundamental thing, which is also true of cops investigating crimes. Your techniques don't have to be perfect. In fact, your techniques will never be perfect because the criminals keep updating their malware to make it more and more nasty. And they know what your tools of, of analysis are and they deliberately target them. So you can never really trust your tools too much. So it's okay to use a sloppy, imperfect method and remember not to fully trust it. And even when you think you're using a perfect method, remember not to fully trust it because it's just like chess. You're playing a game against a smart opponent and sometimes they are ahead of you. So you do just run all these tools on a machine, then run malware and look at what those tools tell you is going on on that machine, even though they might be wrong because most of the time they're right. And that's all you ever get is that most of the time you're right. You have to understand that's why you end up with a lot of tools that do similar things that have to be in your toolkit because very often you try using a tool and it fails and before wasting too much time worrying about it just try another tool anyway so basic static analysis is where you view the malware without trying to read the code so you use things like virus total and strings uh, this is like going under the Christmas tree and finding a box and trying to figure out what's in there without opening the package by squeezing it and shaking it. It's a very superficial analysis, but it's easy. And sometimes you can learn what you need this way. So it's your first step. Basic dynamic analysis is also easy, although you have to have a safe test environment, like a virtual machine that doesn't have any passwords or credit card numbers or anything important on it that you can run malware on and you don't mind just erasing it and restoring it back to a clean condition afterwards. And that's pretty easy too. Advanced static analysis is the most difficult technique where you take an executable file, disassemble it, and it doesn't disassemble back into readable code like C or Visual Basic. It disassembles into assembly code and assembly code is pretty hard to read. So it is pretty painful to read through that. And most people try to avoid this. This is the most difficult 
part. I moved it to the end of the course so people don't freak out so much. Advanced dynamic is easier again, where you run it on a fiend to infect it, but then you run it in a debugger. And debuggers let you stop it and put breakpoints in it and examine what it does in a controlled environment. And that is a lot easier than disassembly. So anyway, those are the four basic techniques. And there's quite a few tools we use, and that's what this course is all about. We'll practice using these tools on some various pieces of uh, fake malware that are relatively harmless, but demonstrate similar behavior to real malware. So there's a lot of types of malware, backdoors, let the attacker have some kind of control, botnets, put your machine in a cluster of machines that are all under control of a command and control server. Downloaders are programs which download more malware because this is often the case because your initial attack often can only load a small file and then you have to download more stages of malware later. Um, there's malware that steals data like keyloggers and password grabbers. There's malware that launches another program. There's root kits that hide in the machine, burrowing deeply into the machine, often into the kernel. So they permanently alter the fundamental operation of the operating system. These are the most difficult programs to find and remove. Um, and they put the machine typically under remote control for a long time. Then there's scareware that puts up something tricking you into doing something. Um, things that send spam, worms and viruses that spread to other machines. And of course, ransomware, very popular these days, encrypting files and demanding Bitcoin to give you the decryption code. So mass malware is malware that's just sent out in something like a spam to millions of people uh, where they all get the same file. That's the most common, but the weakest attack. And this is the one that antivirus can stop. Antivirus is pretty weak defense, but it does stop these mass attacks where millions of people get the same file. And that's something. Targeted attacks, it can't really stop usually. Targeted attacks are where they have customized malware to attack your one company. They've done some research. And, um, you know, for example, Stuxnet. The United States and Israel wanted to stop the Iranian nuclear weapons program, so they carefully wrote a piece of malware just to target certain specific devices in Iran, and it would spread across the world like other malware, but do no harm and clean up after itself until it found the target, like a cruise missile, and then it would destroy those devices. And that is very sophisticated, typically only nation state attackers and the largest organized crime syndicates write that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, it is out there. And if you work for a large company, you do get attacked by rival militaries and uh, large organized crime gangs and nations like Russia, where there isn't much difference between the two. And uh, then you need to analyze it with these custom analysis techniques we're going to use here. So anyway, here's the general rules for malware analysis. Don't let, if you do capture the flag contests, you learn the same thing. If something is difficult and you're wasting a lot of time, then just step back and try another approach. It's very easy to get snarled up in something. You don't need to understand everything. If one tool fails, try another. And remember, you're dealing with intelligent opponents that try to baffle you. I remember years ago, I had a student tell me, don't laugh, I'm the tech at my company. And this guy came to me and believe me, he's not an idiot. And he said, I got this malware, it infected my Windows XP and it turned it into Windows 98. And I told him, you know, a few years ago, I would have said, that guy's an idiot, but now I'm not so sure. And I Googled and that stuff exists. What it did was it would infect your Windows XP. And then when you try to run normal repair tools like window, Windows Update or an antivirus scan, it would play a movie. So you click on Windows Update. Now it would play a movie of the Windows 98 Windows Update running. So you would see these Windows 98 screens appear and that's what I mean. You, if you're getting stuck, you might be going down a maze that was put there by the enemy to make you waste your time. This happened to be in a capture the flag contest. We hacked into a Linux box. I was there with another student who was a real Linux expert. We spent like an hour trying to do things in this Linux box. Nothing worked. And one of the other students came by and he said, that's a honeypot. I know that honeypot. It just looks like Linux. It's not really Linux. Only half the commands work. And I said, you're right. I've been going mad. <laughs> I changed directories and somehow I'm back in the same directory. I list the files and then I look at them. There's nothing there. I can't figure out what's going on here. Anyway, there's a lot of them. Yeah, hack and arch user. Yep, yep. And so there's a bunch of these. So anyway, I've got some cahoots. Uh, let me share this. These are uh, 
if you haven't taken my classes before, uh, you might not know about these, but this is just a, a quiz. It's worth extra credit. If you get in the top three scores, then you'll get some extra credit. I'm just preparing it first, and then I'll move the share to it because I found out that works better. Um, you don't have to do it, but it just prevents people from falling asleep so much. It's still logging in. Okay, now uh, my favorites. Okay, this is 126, 1A. All right, and now I should be able to share that screen. Yeah, there we go. So go to kahoot.it and put in that number, and then you can join this. I'm going to get ready with a place to put the scores. And there's music. One twenty six, yeah. One, all right. Good. And we've got thirty students, so most of them will probably join. I'll wait a bit. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. Yeah, still a few more coming. All right, looks like that's it. All right, deliberately infecting a computer. All right, that's dynamic analysis. Good. You get rated on whether you're right and also how quick you are. So you can get up to a thousand points per question. <laughs> All right. So what technique can find many infected computers from a single point? If you can find network traffic generated by the malware, then of course, that's handy. All right, what technique involves running parts of the code and stopping at breakpoints? Yep, that's a debugger. Good. We'll use them a lot. All right, what malware spreads to other systems? That's a worm. Good. All right, what malware conceals other code? That's root kits, they hide in your system, so something is going on and you can't see it. All right. So, RSA will have to tell me who they are if they want their points. And that's the same for this person. 
And all right, all of them using fake names, which you can do, but you don't get your points unless you tell me your real name. Ah, I see somebody tells me who they are in the chat here. Good. Abacus, I now know who you are. Good. All right. And I've got nickname. Okay. Okay, good. So, all right. All right, let's go back to here. The slides. There we go. Okay. So, here's how static analysis goes then. Okay, if you're not a student, that's fine. So, uh, for static analysis, basic static analysis, you can use antivirus products. You can use the hash of the file and then look it up in a list of hashes online or use strings or functions or headers, all of which are things you can analyze from here. So antivirus scanning is the simplest, of course. You could use an, um, an antivirus product. See, I got questions about rootkits. Are they the same under activity monitor? No, rootkit would not show up under processes. That's the point of it. Um, a rootkit is typically more hidden than that. Some user mode rootkits might show up under activity monitor or task manager, but kernel mode rootkits will typically be hidden and they will not show up in any tool. So they come in different difficulties and we will set them up later. That's a good question. Anyway, so um, you can use an antivirus product or you can use virus total, which is now a Google product that will take your file and you can upload a file or you can just send it a hash of the file and it will look it up in about 30 or 40 antivirus lists and tell you if somebody's already figured out that it's there. The problem is if you have an advanced attacker, they will send you a malicious file and it will not be the same as the file they send other people. So when you upload it to virus total, they will know that they've been caught because they can check virus total and see when someone scanned their file. So it's safer if you want to maintain operational security to just search for the hash value up there. Because one of the things about virus total is if you submit a file, they will send that file to the antivirus companies. It exposes it. So that's a thing to be aware of. Um, when you're dealing with advanced attackers, you often want to avoid tipping them off. Once you catch, realize you've been hacked, you don't want them to know that while you analyze the system. You want to figure out what's going on without alerting the bad guys. All right, and so hashing, of course, is just taking a file and boiling it down to a fingerprint. The original one people used a lot was MD5, then there was SHA-1, now there's SHA-2, and they all work about the same way. They calculate a mathematical summary of the whole file and have a fingerprint of a fixed size. This was 128 bits, 160 bits, and this is usually 256 bits. So the point is that's intended to be a unique fingerprint of a file. In principle, MD5 and SHA-1 have collisions, but you don't see them very often. So they're probably useful. The reason people are switching to SHA-2 is there are no known collisions of SHA-2. So as far as anybody knows, a SHA-2 fingerprint of a file is completely unique, like a human fingerprint. There is no other file that you will ever find with the same um, hash value. Uh, Windows doesn't give you a hash calculator by default, so you can download one. HashCalc is one of them that can calculate all these various hashes. And they just look like this, long strings of hexadecimal numbers. They look like random numbers. And the point is, if you download a file from a website and then calculate the hash, you can see that the file got there intact if the hash is the expected value. So that's the point. Um, and therefore, you have a way to label the file for a unique file name. You can share the hash with other people. And this is what people use as a unique identifier of files. Now, strings give you a lot more information. A string, this is a, a Linux command and it's been ported to Windows. This just reads any file and it looks for any series of readable characters, like five characters more or longer, <coughs> terminated by a null, and just prints them out. And some of them are just random bytes that don't really mean anything but all the readable strings will appear. And so you'll see error messages, commands, help menus, the names of functions. So it's pretty useful. One trick though, is that Microsoft uses Unicode, a very old version of Unicode called wide characters that uses two bytes for every character. So in ASCII, 
you could have bad and it would just be BAD and then a null. So it would be a total of four bytes. But in Unicode, it would have an extra null byte after each of these characters and then two nulls here. So you really need to know that. Um, a normal strings command won't find these. So what we use is bin text, which is a free tool from, I think, McAfee, which can find either one. Microsoft uses Unicode for almost everything because it's an international operating system and it supports, you know, all the commercially important languages like Arabic and Chinese and Japanese, and those use these 16-bit uh, characters. All right. So if you run strings on a file, you'll see things like this. You might see IP addresses and the name of a uh, Windows library and the name of a Windows API call and then a error message of some sort, but then also some random bits that are just readable, but they're not, they're technically strings, but they're not in fact used as strings. Bin text is what we're going to use mostly, a nice Windows GUI tool that can just give you a list of all the things here. Notice how it starts with this program cannot be run in DOS mode. All executable programs start with that message. You can spot it there. All Windows executable files. Anyway, so if you don't want people to see the strings in your code, then you can pack it. Now you could make a self-extracting zip file. That's the simplest kind of packing. While it's zipped, you can't see the strings, but of course, everybody knows how to unzip it. And on Windows systems, you can just double click it to unzip it. So what malware authors do is they use other kinds of packers. And the point of a packer is the executable is compressed. The packed executable has scrambled all the bytes so the strings are not visible. And then there's a wrapper program on the outside. If it's a self-extracting zip file, this is an executable that automatically unzips it. Otherwise, it's going to need some other kind of wrapper. And um, all right, if you use PEID, one of the tools we're going to use, this gives you a simple analysis of what's going on with the file. And it will detect certain things, like it'll give you the language the program is written in here. And here it tells you it's packed with the UPX packer, which is a very common open source packer. The UPX packer has a wrapper program when you run it that will take the packed code and load it in memory and run it. But it will not unzip it on the disk. So the memory part of it will run, but the file on the disk will remain um, with the strings obscured. So you can pack things with UPX command and they will then get smaller. So here's chatty and here's chatty packed. Chatty was 592 kilobytes, but packed it shrunk down to 272 kilobytes and the strings uh, became harder to see there. Although it's not so clear from here, they're, they went from having um, 33,000 strings to 23,000 strings. And in fact, they're no longer readable. All right, um, be aware PEID apparently has plugins, which I've never used. Uh, one thing though to be aware of is some of those plugins will actually run the malware. So you have to be careful, always work in a virtual machine that's not important to you because it's very easy to accidentally run malware. I've done this with PHP malware. I've seen packed PHP malware and I'm trying to unpack it. So I add, I run only part of the code and stop when it's unpacked and I've made the mistake where I run it too far and it starts doing malicious things. So, you know, whenever you're working with malware, work in a safe environment where there's nothing important to you because it may well be that some of your tools will run that malware without you knowing that. Anyway, all these files are the portable executable files. And this is a uh, fundamental thing you have to know how Windows executable files work. Is there any defense against VM escaping? Well, um, no, I don't think so. The only defense I know is um, to keep your stuff updated. VM escapes are still relatively rare, but that is that is an issue. If you work in a virtual machine, it is possible that malware escapes the virtual machine and attacks the host. It's even easier if you use containers. So real virtual machines are considered more safe than containers. And of course, a real physical computer with an air gap is even safer. Yeah, and shared folders are dangerous. Yeah, turn off the shared folders, of course. Um, yeah. Anyway, so all the files that run in Windows are portable executable files, executable files and DILs. And so this is the data structure. Um, so it has a header, the portable executable header, and this tells you the type of application, the library functions, and so on. You can take measures to prevent the malware from realizing it's in a VM. Yeah, you can do that too. And you often have to want to do that to uh, try to make, hopefully it won't try to escape. That's a thought. 
but yeah, they're not that uh, that secure. These are good questions. So Lord PE is one of the tools that lets you see the structure of malware while it's running uh, any program. And you can then see it has a text section, a data section, a resource section, and a relocation section. And we're going to talk a lot more about these various sections. These are the memory sections used by running program. And uh, there are a lot more program sections that could be there, but um, the ones you'll always see are text and data and typically our data. Text contains the actual executable code and the rest contain data that's used by the code. So let's try another Kahoot. Let me, uh, should be right here, 1B and I'll launch it and then I'll switch the share to it. Okay, share. Yeah, looks like it worked. Okay, good. How do you form container of VM? Containers are a different technology than virtual machines. They're uh, smaller and use less resources, but they do not separate the guest from the host as much. Docker containers is what they are. They're very popular these days, but they're not as safe as virtual machines. And there are tools to convert a host to uh, various other forms like a virtual machine. And I think a container, although I'm not sure. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. All right. All right a mathematical number that uniquely identifies a file. It's a hash, good. All right, what technique finds the readable text? Okay, that's strings. All right, uh, what file type has a header specifying sections like this? Okay, those are the portable executable files, which include exes and dills, but this is the uh, best answer. Portable executable files have the PE header specifying the sections, which we're going to play with a lot. And what kind of file is shared by many different programs? Those are the libraries. Dynamic link libraries is what Windows uses. It makes programs smaller and faster, but it is dangerous and unsanitary. And is the main way malware takes over your machine. So HEMA L, sounds like that might be a real name. And, uh, Costas sounds like a real name. Twisted does not sound like a real name. So they have to tell me their name if they want the points. Will Tails protect you against VM escapes? As far as I know, it won't. Tails is basically a bunch of virtual machines, but as far as I know, they are not like in any way more uh, more secure. I see, Twisted has told me who they are, good. Okay, good. Um, it's a good question, but I don't think Tails will protect you from VM escapes any more than any other virtualization product. But VM escapes are not too common yet. 
What's more common is a malware that just notices it's in a virtual machine and refuses to do malicious things to frustrate the analyst. Anyway, so we talked briefly before about libraries. So linked libraries import functions. Your main function uses a library function, which it then has to import from a library. Now you can link with um, static, runtime, or dynamic. Can I repeat questions on how we detect rootkits? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, oh yeah, uh, well it, it's not easy. Yeah, we'll talk. I'll talk about that later, Chaz. Let me go here. Um, so the uh, anyway, you have static linking at runtime and dynamically. Static linking is where if you have a program that uses the internet, it takes the internet library and attaches it to your code and makes your code bigger. And then if another program uses the internet, it makes a second own copy of the library and runs it. So that is static linking, where you take the entire library and include it in your code. It is not common on Windows at all. And it used to be common in Unix and Linux, but even Unix and Linux have uh, mostly switched to dynamic linking because it's so much faster. Runtime linking is another option where it connects to libraries only when needed. Um, but the most common technique is dynamic linking, where the um, when your program runs, it launches it, the operating system looks in the header and says, oh, this program wants the networking libraries. And the operating system decides, do I need to load the network libraries into RAM or has some other program already caused me to load them? In which case, I'll just connect this program to those networking libraries that are already there. That's dynamic linking. And that means you're sharing a library that came from an external source with other programs. And as you can imagine, that creates some holes. Um, runtime linking wouldn't connect until you try to execute a program. Um, and if you use Microsoft Office, um, when I used it years ago, Office 2000, it would have certain advanced features. And when you click them, it would say you have to put in the install disk so I can add more code to your office. So the entire program did not load just from first launching. More of it would load later only if you chose certain options. That's runtime linking. It's not very common. So the libraries, the PE header lists every library and function that will be run. And so Microsoft library uh, API calls are often quite pretty useful. URL download to file, the names are pretty clear sometimes. You can see what that's going to do. Going to download some file from the internet. So you can use dependency walker. You may have done this when you run programs on Windows, a box pops up and says, this program is missing x743.dil. Um, so dependency walker is how you uh, is intended to help developers avoid this. Um, so if you look at services.exe and loaded in dependency walker, it'll show you all the libraries it's using, and it uses a lot of libraries. Um, these are all the libraries it uses, and then it uses certain functions in each library. Um, but if you have a malicious program, services ex underscore, this is, it has a name to look like services to fool people who just look at running processes, but it's not services. And you can see it only uses two libraries, which is very strange. Real programs use a lot of libraries. So this is the kind of thing you might see in Dependency Walker from a malicious file. And so if you look in Dependency Walker, there are imports and exports. And um, the imports are going to be programs it gets from a library. Things like malloc and exit, those are C function calls, which it has to find in a library. And then it exports just some labels that are used, it doesn't really export any functions if it's an exe typically, because it does not provide a service to another function. So dill files have a lot of exports. Those are the functions they provide for other people to import. But exes typically don't export much in the way of functions. And so here's some common Windows libraries. Kernel32.dil lets you call kernel routines that have direct access to the hardware. Here's the API that gives you service manager and registry. Here's the user components like buttons and scroll bars. Here's graphics, GDI. These are the libraries that we would import if you're going to have those functions. NTDIL, this is the interface to the Windows kernel. Now kernel.dil is the high level library you're supposed to use to control the kernel. This one here, ntdil, you're not supposed to call directly. This is called the native kernel. 
and uh, malware uses it sometimes, but uh, typical commercial programs do not call NTDIL directly. Here's Winsock. You may have known the Two Cows Library that just shut down this week, the ultimate collection of Winsock software. These are the fundamental networking libraries that made the internet from the Berkeley standard um, Unix distribution that developed the protocols used for TCP IP. This is the Windows version of it. So almost all networking libraries, networking programs use these, but most of them don't call it directly anymore. They use higher level libraries like WinINet that lets you do something like download a file with just one command. These make you do the TCP handshake by hand, bit by bit, you know, it's not, uh, this is what's called direct sockets, not that common anymore. Can Dependency Walker identify dills of packers and protectors? Uh, it would, if you ran it on a packed file, it would only show you the unpacker. All the stuff inside would be hidden, just like strings, an important question. So here's Notepad. Um, in PE view, PE view shows you the structure of the file. Here it's got the import address table and here it shows you all the functions it calls. From advanced API, it calls reg set value and is text unicode. And there's a lot of these. So you can, it's not hidden in any way. Just right in the header is a list of all the functions that are required here so it can load them. Yeah, I, uh, the IAT is not built on the run, but it would be, yes, for a packed file, it would. So the packed file has to rebuild the import address table and rebuild all the sections. And we'll go through UPX in quite a lot of detail later in the course, you'll see. Exactly right. The only thing you'll see in a packed file is the unpacker. All the rest of the program will just be seen as sort of scrambled data and the unpacker will have to rebuild it. So here's advanced api.dil. You can see it exports all these functions, access, check, and so on. Those are the functions it provides to programs that might want to use them. And uh, all right, um, here's iTunes setup. Notice this message, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Remember that's the start of every program. Anyway, so here's a keylogger, for example, it would import user 32 and use set windows hook, which will cook the key presses. And um, the, it will then uh, export these. Let's see, I think um, I'm just trying to figure this out. Uh, we've been here about an hour. I think let's take a break right now. Let me process this video and I'll make a second video of the second bit. Let's take about a 10 minute break. And then I've got some questions to answer and I don't wanna rush through this. I'm going to break it here and we'll continue in about 10 minutes. I have to um, st stop recording.